Up, girl, girl, living the dream over here. That in Florida. Part. While I'm I'm in uh, tank tops today, you were in a beanie. So that just tells you about the different worlds we're living in. But I'm happy <laughs> here in Florida. I won't be happy. Ask me in in six months when it's humid, as I'll get out. And Portland is gorgeous and beautiful in the summer. Well, um, at least but, there's one good thing about Florida, and that's sunshine. <laughs> it is sunshine. That's about what we got going for us. But um, <laughs> here we go. Another g- great episode coming your way. Here we go. Let's get into it. Well, before we get into this episode, though, we got a couple housekeeper items. So you may have seen on our Instagram and already have experienced a couple episodes. But yes, Tuesdays are our new day. We are so excited for the shift. We felt like we needed to give you more time in the week to digest this episode. So we're now on um, Tuesdays. That'll be our new launch day for all of our episodes. So stay tuned. Look out every Tuesday. We're here on your favorite streaming platforms and on YouTube. And if you're not already, follow us, like us, subscribe, all of the things. Um, We have our newsletter that's coming back at you. So make sure to sign, uh, to give us your email so that we can send you our newsletter. Yeah, those are some really important things. And I'm glad you're putting it at the front ends of our episodes now, T, and not the back end in case people didn't listen. Yeah, do all of those things. Um, and why don't we jump in? Because this is one of my dear friends and you're going to tell us a little bit about her. But usually I tell everybody who the guest actually is. So May I have the honor of Elise saying who it is today? Or should we wait and then I read her bio before they even know her? Well, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. I like it. I like it. So hold, hold tight, special guest. We're about to introduce you. So our guest today was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, where she still resides. She's married to her partner, Aaron, of 12 years, with whom she shares two boys with. Declan, who's eight, and Levi, five. She earned her degree in organizational communications at George Fox University and has worked various administrative support roles over the past 15 years. In the past five years, she's grown more passionate in the ways of supporting marginalized communities and finding ways to make people feel valued, seen, heard, and cared for. After working full-time in the nonprofit field for over a decade, She is now building up her own virtual administrative services business, as well as spending time volunteering in her boys' school and connecting with friends and family in her community. She enjoys time with her family and friends and finding ways to connect with her Chinese culture. Activities that give her joy are reading, attending concerts, Broadway and comedy shows, movies, hiking, game nights, laughing really hard, which we are going to do on this episode, and dining around the greater Portland area. E, I'll let you introduce her. Okay. Well, this is what I thought was so funny as you're reading your bio is everybody's going to know who it is because they clicked on the episode and it says her name. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, you guys, Titi and I were trying to surprise you, but as you already know, this episode is with one of my really dear friends, Jana Kelsey, everybody. Yes, Jana. Hi, Jana. Hello. I'm so glad you're on this episode with us because you know, if you're you're used to my chaos and now you've just welcomed into TT Nice Chaos, Jana, we're as goofy as they come, but your story hopefully is going to regulate us a little bit more, Um, but- Friend, I'm so glad you're here. I'm going to do more of an informal um, introduction of you because we're a- actually friends. But like I said, Jana and I, um, we're on Young Life staff together in Oregon. Honestly, we were just talking before the episode, probably for the last eight years, we became really good friends. And I would say you hear a lot about my frustration and my exit with 
Young Life. And even though it's, it is a great organization that is trying to accomplish really great things, there was just some really hard <laughs> struggles is a nice way to put it, right, Jana, that we had to endure and walk through. And Jana was literally my greatest ally in the midst of it. And we fought for each other. And there's no one who I felt like fought harder for me. And it makes me want to cry. So Jana, I'm grateful for you and the re the redeeming parts of my story that you played such a pivotal role in, um, in, in our time in Young Life. And then we've stayed friends even post Young Life. She's not on Young Life staff anymore. I'm not on Young Life staff anymore. Um, and yeah, I'm just so excited for the world to, to get to know you today. So Jana, like TT said, is an American born Chinese woman with a story that weaves through the complexities of identity, particularly race, and a lifelong feeling of being invisible. She was raised in Portland, Oregon, and she navigated this tightrope between her culture and heritage of her home and the pressure of assimilation in a predominantly white community in Portland. Her journey spans from the pews of her local church all the way to classrooms in her school, which made um, her go on this journey to look for belonging and, and figure out where does she really belong and where does she fit in. Jana's college years brought Aaron, who also was young, on Young Life staff with us, into her life. And her chapter with him is filled with love and challenges and honestly, the harsh realities of not always feeling supported by and accepted by family. Uh, their path to marriage was anything but smooth <laughs> and facing resistance um, really created this um, test of their resolve and love. A big turning point in her life was when the incredible movie Crazy Rich Asians came out and it inspired this cultural celebration in Jana. And she started from that point on to embark on this journey of reclaiming her cultural heritage. That's how she phrases it. And I love that. She doesn't want to just embrace tradition, but she wants to find her voice in a world that often overlooked her as an Asian American. Her story is intertwined with personal trials, with the strain of family ties and the roller coaster of mental health struggles in the midst of a faith journey. Perhaps nothing tested her faith more and tested her resilience more than this crazy incident, harrowing incident that happened in her life where her son fell from a third story window and that could have ended really tragically. And thank you, Jesus, that it didn't. Um, and I got to walk through her during that time. Wow. Gosh. Um, Declan's miraculous recovery became a pivotal moment in Jana's life. And it prompted a shift in her faith as well. Through all these experiences, Jana just incredibly continues to navigate the complexity of her identity, her faith, where she belongs and, and really creating spaces of belonging for others. And she does that with a spirit that refuses to become invisible ever again. And so her story is a testament to the power of resilience, love, and an unending journey towards self-discovery. So Jana, <laughs> man, girl, I'm already crying. <laughs> We're not even asking questions yet. <laughs> oh. Well, welcome. You made welcome, my story welcome. feel like, wow, who is this person? They sound really cool. <laughs> That's what everybody's so, listening is going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank you guys for having me on. It's, it's a privilege to share my story and engage with two awesome people with my story. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we should dive into this conversation. We always, always start with an icebreaker. Aaron loves icebreakers. I do too, though. I can't lie. You learn a lot about a person from the way that they answer an icebreaker. So I'm going to start with this one. Okay. So if you had, are you a reader? Uh, yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. I was like, this is going to be a weird question if you're not a reader. Well, I, so well, hang on, hang on, hang on. I picked this question intentionally because the best books I have ever read in my life have all been sent to me in the mail by Jana. So yes, Ooh. you are a reader friend because you okay. are always sending me incredible <laughs> books. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Fair. So you're a reader. Okay. So then this will be a good one. Since you love the book she sends you, then Jana, what's your favorite book that you've ever read? I'm going to say two things. 
one, I would say my favorite nonfiction book is Permission to Come Home. It's the it's the book that I've identified with um, that goes over. It's, it's essentially reclaiming mental health for Asian Americans. It was written by Jenny Wang like a couple years ago. And I remember reading it and mental health and Asian communities don't really intersect. It's like really taboo to talk about your mental health in the Asian community. And so I felt like reading this book was like opening up more about who I am it was like oh my gosh this is me you know and so it was just a powerful it was a book that made me feel seen I would say that um I would say on the fictional side one of my favorite books was Little Women I grew up reading it I read it probably over and over and over saw all the movies it's a childhood favorite so I'm gonna give you two answers for that I like those answers Little Women, to be honest with you, confession, I've never read the book, but man, I love but I <laughs> love gosh. that movie. I watched that movie on repeat growing up. Like the the, the I don't 94? know the one, yeah, the, the one with like um with like Claire Danes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Who played yep. Beth. Oh, such a good one. Such a good yep. one. Sounds like great, I got some homework movie. to do. Either read <laughs> the book or watch the movie. <laughs> do all the above. Yeah, it's good. Well, Janet, our guests are the ones who title our episodes because it's your story that you're going to share with us today. And so if you were to title your life and your story and what you're sharing with us today, what would that title be? Yeah, I I would title it Choosing to be Seen. Mm. That's good. Uh That's good. And I love the choosing to be seen. It puts you as the protagonist of your own story. That's amazing. I love that. Okay. Uh, Let's dive into the story then. I would love to go back to the beginning. We heard a bit of your story. Thank you, Erin, for sharing that. And thank you for for sharing your story with us um, as well. But for our listeners, I think it's really good for... Um, them to understand your origins and where this all started. So your parents are both Chinese, but um, you were born here in the Pacific Northwest. How did your family end up here? I know pieces of that story. So I'm going to do my best to share what I know. Um, I know my mom's parents. So my mom's dad moved uh, sounds like his grandpa was here for what she said was the building the railroad. Um, and so had sent for his son to come over, so my maternal grandpa. He went over here due to the Japanese attack on China. So went over here, did some work, went back during the war, and then came back, got married, uh, and then came back to the States to work at his family's restaurant. So they established in the States and then all were in the restaurant industry, came over and then was working in that area. I think my paternal grandparents was similar. I know they did work over here, went back, started a family and then came back over to the States. So that's more kind of the dive of reclaiming my own culture and origin story is learning more about my culture. And so that's a piece that I'm still working on learning about. One of the things you talked about was like, you grew up in a Christian household though. And that's pretty Mm -hmm. non-traditional, especially um, in Chinese culture. So how Mm -hmm. did your parents um, convert to Christianity or were they born into it? Where does the Christian background come from for your family? My family, we were raised at a church in Portland called Chinese Baptist Church, and um, it's been around for over 100 years. And I believe the community to still connect with people in their culture. So Chinese culture, you're also learning to navigate this new kind of life, um, adapting into Western culture, English, um, but still finding a space to, I think, identify with other Chinese folks. And so I know my mom started there. 
I think she was there when she was very young. Um, and then I think that's, they connected there. That's just what you did. You just went to church and it was a way to um, adapt and assimilate into Western culture. She got married, I think it was her mid-20s, that my dad got married. And then they both resided there and they're still to, there to today. Um, and so we were fully raised there. I was there till I was early college. Um, and they took on what they were taught. So it's Baptist. We were raised pretty conservative. Um, and so being a Christian looked like a certain way, you, very Bible focused in what we were taught. Um, but it also intersected community wise. Predominantly, everybody in my church was Chinese. There's some other ethnicities of the Asian culture, but predominantly Chinese. I basically grew up Chinese and my, a lot of my family was here in the States as well. So I was around my Asian community for a good chunk of my life, um, growing up. So the faith aspect was. Asian culture is very much on tra traditions and um, this is the way you do this, straightforward, black and white. So whatever we were taught in churches, we just adapt that into our home life. The difference I would say was it was Americanized. So there were things that we were taught um, that I think was predominantly taught by the dominant culture, which is white culture. And so a lot of the things traditionally when we were raised, I remember my mom talking about all the tr traditions that um, my grandparents knew. Um, there's things you do, there's things you don't do in the culture. That kind of all disappeared because in Christian culture, at least the Christian culture that we were taught, um, that's like demonic or of the devil or it just wasn't Christian. We just didn't do things. There's things like, Chinese New Year's, we always celebrated it, but it was literally the celebration. It's like, hey, it's Chinese New Year's. Let's hand out some red envelopes and um, eat a nice meal, which is great, um, and see our family. But there's so many other traditions. Like, I don't even know the history. I'm still learning that now. Um, that's something we weren't taught. There's so many things leading up to the Lunar New Year celebration, and then it actually spans for like two weeks. I just learned that the last couple wow. of years. Because we didn't do that. We literally just did the day. That was it. We didn't decorate the house. So it was just, oh, like we have the day. You celebrate the day. You move on. And I think as I've gotten older and leaning into this uh, culture board and learning about it, I'm like, I want to give my kids something that they uh, experience that's a part of them, that they can hopefully pass down someday to their families. And so every year I learn something or I try to grab something on that I can put into my home. Um, so like this year, I put everything in my calendar. This is when Lunar Year starts. This is when you get ready. This is when you do these things with people. Um, and so I try to make Lunar New Year or Chinese New Year for us. It's like a Christmas part two, right? The yeah. celebration of it all. Um, decorations, presents. So my boys are biracial. Um, and so I want them to have an identity with their Asian culture. Because they yeah. are predominantly in a white culture. So they're going to see a lot more of that. Um, so I want to make um, more intentionality of like, you are Asian and this is what it means to be Asian and you're celebrated for who you are. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's good. I love that you're reclaiming your identity because I feel like so often in order to live the American dream, it means denying your roots sometimes afro latinas how i identify but i can definitely resonate with you talking about that almost like de denying of your roots or the assimil assimilation that happens in order to adapt to the environment that you're in for us a lot of it was through language and not speaking the language, my mom was pretty adamant about the fact that if we went to school and we were put in English second language programs or we were bilingual, oftentimes we were given a worse education. You notice English being predominantly spoken in the home and things like that. So it's just crazy to see how our cultural identities can get watered down over time based on the environment's 
that we're in. And if we don't make the choice to reclaim those or to actively pursue who we are or to know our cultural roots that we could just continue to lose them even further. So I love that you're doing that for your boys. That's awesome. I think when you're immigrants coming over to America, they are trying to fit in because it's, it's totally different cultures. And so what I inherited as growing up is you have to give up something in order to assimilate into another. And me now is like, why can't we coexist? Why can't those things coexist together? Like this whole Christianity or faith believing, why can't that coexist with the traditions of your culture? And I, I believe that can coexist, but we were taught that it can't coexist. So, yeah. yeah. So, Jana, it's almost like you were growing up between two different worlds. When I was doing your introduction, I talked about how you grew up in predominantly white schools. And and even your church, this was fascinating to me that you were talking about that even the church that you went to, even though it was, um, what was the title of it again? Chinese Baptist. Of, Chinese Baptist. But you said that the, mm-hmm. the pastor of it was white, right? Yeah, I'd say the time frames I was there... I think there was one pastor that was Chinese, but okay. predominantly from what I remember, and that was probably my like early years. So I don't remember yeah. much of that. Um, yeah. All the years I remember, we've always yeah. had a white pastor, a white male pastor. Right. So, so you yeah. grew up in this interesting dichotomy because you have your culture, but then everywhere else you're being asked to assimilate. So your church from your memory is white male pastors, the schools that you go to, we've talked about before, you didn't feel like you were the minority, yet you have this beautiful, I mean, now that you are able to recognize, you have this beautiful cultural heritage that you're wanting to reclaim, but it, it wasn't always that way. And so you were always between these two worlds. And so my question for you would be, in the midst of feeling like you didn't belong, how do you feel like you navigated that dichotomy? Yeah. Referring to what you were saying, I remember my home community and my church community were all predominantly Asian. It's like two worlds, right? You're living in this like, all I know is Asian community and then all I know is white community. Right. So when I'm in my white community, I stand out very clearly. I do remember so many times I've thought, I wish I was white because then I wouldn't stand out. Or I fit in in the way of, I feel like I would get more opportunities if I was white, you know? And so I think it was just really hard. Like, I didn't think about it often, but there would be times where I was like, this would be easier if I was white. Or maybe I get called on during class if I was white. Maybe I would look more official if I was white. Um, And so I would say growing up that, yeah, it was hard. I'm trying to fit in somewhere as what you were talking about. Like, like when I was in my Asian communities, I'm like, this is normal. And then when I'm in the white, which is still predominantly everything else, I don't want to be seen, but I want to be seen, if that makes sense. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I think I, I feel a little shame sometimes in those yeah. spaces. Yeah. So. Well, and you've described it before as it, that made you feel invisible. Um, and I feel like in a lot of cases, and just in knowing you and being friends with you, you've played behind the scenes. And I would say some of that maybe is personality. A lot of that has to do with the the way that you functioned in, in the world and society for a, for a lot of your life was just not feeling seen and, and honestly being taught to not be seen. And yeah. then um, you have this moment in your life where you're like, wait a minute, this isn't right. And I think that moment came, like we talked about earlier, in you seeing the movie Crazy Rich Asians, and that sparked something in you. So to tell us a- about that experience and kind of yeah. what happened in the process of that. Yeah. Crazy Rich Asians was a big movie that came out, uh, I think it was back in 2018, maybe a little before that. But um, yeah, I-, I remember hearing hype about it because, oh, it's an all Asian cast. I didn't really think much of it. And then my um, sister texted me and was like, hey, have you guys seen this yet? Um, You should see it. Um, I saw and it was actually a lot more emotional than I thought. And I was like, interesting. It's like a rom-com. I saw the trailer. I wasn't like super 
I didn't see it being like, I want to see this. So I was intrigued and I'm like, okay, I'll just, I'll go support the Asian community and support a movie that has a bunch of Asians in it. Um, so I went, I went with my husband and uh, his wife and uh, I remember sitting in it and then I know the very end of the movie, I was crying because I was like, that was amazing. And it wasn't the content of the movie in the way of like the storyline. Like it was, you know, it's a nice romantic comedy. It's like, yay, there's a happy ending. My emotions weren't attached to that. It was like, oh, this is incredible to see people that look like me on a, on the big screen. Everybody looks like me on this big screen. And I remember seeing this interview with the cast and one of the actors was like, you don't know what you're not seeing until you see it. And I think for me that awoke this thing in me of like, oh, I'm proud to be Asian. And so it was this turning point for me in my journey to like, hey, I want to be seen as Asian. Like, I want to be seen as Chinese. Wow. And what does that look like? Um, and how do I open doors for people like me to have a voice? If you know Asian culture, you know women are predominantly quiet and silent. You don't rock the boat. You don't cause any drama. You're not confrontational. Um, you kind of just move on if there is anything. Um, and so I just grew up doing that. There's things I noticed growing up. I'm like, I don't want to do that. But then I was like, oh, I'm doing that because that's just ingrained in me from what I was modeled. And so sometime after seeing that movie and wanting to have connection to my culture, I was like, how do I find a voice for myself and also find a voice for other people like me, but the other people that look like me or other people that are on the margins that don't usually have a voice. I'm not even talking about just race. Uh, I was an administrator in a nonprofit world where our roles are at the bottom of the totem pole. Why are admins being treated like the lowest position in this organization? They're doing like so much stuff to be able to get their bosses or their colleagues to a level of excellence and they're being treated like they're nobodies. And so I also made a point, not just for my like BIPOC staff in my, the organization I worked for to have a voice. I also want these positions that are treated as lower and less than to be seen as equal. So that's a lot of the journey of like, started with this movie, this random movie, and then it led to this journey of how do we get our voices elevated and these marginalized people and positions elevated and seen. A couple episodes back, um, and I don't want to misquote him, but one of our guests said, if you look at your place of pain, oftentimes you can find your purpose there. And as I hear your story and I hear this igniting inside of you it wasn't just for you it's been so much bigger it's been about allowing you to advocate for those that may feel invisible or feel voiceless or not heard or not seen or not valued or not cared for everybody needs a Jenna in their corner advocating yeah. and giving them the microphone or fighting for them to be seen and seeing them. I think before the fight even happens, you have to see people. And so right. I love that this isn't just about you. This has been so much bigger than you and you've used it for other people. But I think even sometimes we can hide behind our purpose. And while you're fighting for other people, I guess my question is, are you still fighting for yourself? Are you allowing yourself to be seen? Or do you still find yourself hiding at times yeah it's a good question yeah um i think it's so much easier i've had this conversation with aaron it's so easy to fight for someone yep but it's really hard to fight for yourself um uh, so i'd say yes i am trying i'm on the trajectory of getting there uh but it's a journey and I, I love advocating for people. I think it's fun to make somebody feel worthy and seen and cared for. It just makes life worth living. You know, I don't get 
a space where people are devalued and it makes me really frustrated. Uh, it's hard for me. I'm starting my own business. So you're putting a price tag on yourself for your services. So you're like, do I, do I deserve this? Even though I'm like, I, I know I deserve this. I do good work, but it's a lot Ooh. easier to do it for other people than it is to do it on yourself. Because imposter syndrome will have you out here hiding under your desk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Even wow. even when you know that you have a gift, even when you know what you're doing and you know how to do it, gosh, trying to like push yourself to do it, especially when you're starting it yourself. It's why it took TT and I so freaking long yeah. to even start our podcast. So you better believe that we're going to be championing Ning, you, Jana, and your new endeavor, because we, we've been there. We know what this is like to start our, your mm -hmm. own thing. And it's, it can feel scary for sure. Yep. Yeah. I was talking to Deb maybe a couple weeks ago. And I said to her, I was like, I don't often question my work. That's not the problem. I know I'll do good work and I know I work hard, but oftentimes I can find myself questioning my worth. And yep. that is very different. And that's yep. a hard pill to swallow. If I know I do good work, and as you mentioned, you're starting your business, you know you do good work. You know you're excellent. You worked in this for over a decade and have the resume and the background and the experience. And so I just think it's so crazy that we then are like, well, can I charge this for my services? Like, heck yes, you can, girl. You got this. <laughs> like, <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's true. Well, and I know that you have other people in your corner that are cheering you on and, and pushing you to advocate for yourself and they're advocating alongside you. And one of those people is your husband, Aaron. Um, so let's, let's move on to a little bit about your relationship with Aaron. Um, in college, you guys met, you dated, he's white. Your family wasn't too keen on him. It didn't go over too well. And then you guys get engaged and it starts to cause some contention in, in the midst of, of your family. And um, I want to just hear a little bit about what was his introduction into your family like and how did that impact your relationship with them? Yeah, uh, we met at a summer job, so we didn't go to school together or anything, but we met at a summer job. And so but was introduced by somebody in my church. And then in the process, he was actually involved with Young Life. Um, and he started working for my church. He was leading the youth. Uh, so another white so, guy, another white, white guy. guy. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you're white, you kind of stand out in this church. Yeah. So I remember being like, Hey, there's this white guy. Who the heck is he? A student at Multnoma. He's trying to do some young life work. Da, da, da. So fast forward, we meet, um, and then connect. And then at some point we, become friends and then decide that we want to date. Uh, we try to do all the things you're supposed to do. So we met with my parents, introduced them, and my parents weren't super fond of the idea. I can't give you reasons why. I actually don't know. Um, and so that obviously carried into the engagement. And yep. then the thing with some Asian culture, there's a big emphasis on the father's opinion. And so the father's opinion kind of trickles down everybody else's opinion and so that's kind of what happened with my family my husband wasn't super welcomed into the family from the beginning yep. and so that started the trajectory of where my dynamic with my family is um so the thing is conflict doesn't usually get addressed it kind of just there's a conflict and then it kind of moves on in asian culture because if you rock the boat or you address something and create, create conflict, and then there's tensions and you don't want tensions. So you just kind of move on and just pretend like it doesn't happen. And so that's what happened um, through that. And I had a lot of diving into what that meant for me to have a little bit of a disconnect from this family. Because Chinese culture, Asian culture, it's very collective in the way you navigate family. And, I'm, and I would say my husband, Aaron, taught me a lot of white culture, even though I lived in white culture. But when you're in it with someone, right. you're learning the difference. It's like my the upbringing I had and the way I did things, that's normal. But then you hear somebody else's normal. And you're like, wait, that's not normal. And then vice right. versa. 
Yeah. And so I would say navigating that, especially in the first year of marriage was like, okay, this isn't normal. Like I'm supposed to be attached to my family, even though I have created this new family. So how do I reconcile these two things when they don't work together? They're not coinciding together. And so that brought me into the therapy world because I don't know what to do with these feelings I have because that's another thing. Asians don't really process feelings, you know? And so how do I reconcile these emotions I'm having? Because I can't really talk to anybody in my family about it. And so my husband, Aaron, was like, you should probably go talk to a therapist. And I'm like, no, you're not supposed to do that because then that means something's wrong with you. (laughs) Because that's the other thing with Asian culture. You're not supposed to ask for help. You're not supposed to talk to somebody about what's going on inside you and uh, emotion-wise. And um, so that was a really hard point to be like, all right, I need to go talk to someone yeah, about this, aka a therapist, and then diving into feelings and mental health world. And it was scary. It was a scary thing. And so I did it and I've been doing it for a decade. <laughs> I've been in therapy for a while. Um, but it's, it's a huge part of my journey because it's allowed me to identify experiences I have and words to feelings I've had um, in a way that's healthy and um, in just claiming who I am as a person. There's language for things and it makes a big difference. And then you learn about boundaries, which is also a big thing of something I didn't have growing up, you know? And so learning boundaries intersecting with culture it's been a point of contention but it for me it brought out this healthier self now i can see the differences of how i respond to things versus how my family responds to things because it's like oh now i got tools in my toolbox yeah they don't have those tools yet so i can't even if i'm feeling feelings about it i also understand they don't have those tools and that's okay why why there's a disconnect because i've done some work and they're not there yet and that's okay yeah. So, man, and it's hard being like the chain breaker, yeah. like to break some of those chains or those generational curses or traditions or traumas in our family. And what was the name of the book that you said was your favorite book again at the beginning? Uh, permission to come home. Permission to come home. And I remember when you were talking about permission to come home, that was really about this Asian culture and mental health. And I love that you were able to experience your own journey. And I mean, man, God bless your husband who was able to introduce you there and hold your hand as you navigated some of that. And for him to also navigate that and experience that. And so you've been married for 12 years. So it's been over a decade. And I'm sure that comes with a lot of stuff. Do you feel like you've forgiven your family or what is that forgiveness journey look like in terms of how it relates to your family? Yeah, that's a good question. I think forgiveness is a journey. I think in Christian culture, um, we're taught like, you need to forgive. There's something wrong happening. You just got to forgive. And for some reason, like that means forgiveness makes everything better. And I, I think that this journey is like, okay, if I've forgiven, why aren't things better? You know, on Sunday at church, our pastor was talking about reconciliation, which I kind of interweave forgiveness and reconciliation. And something his therapist friend shared, reconciliation, you could just say sorry. A lot of people are like, sorry. And usually that there, I think in the Christian world can be like, sorry, so we're good, right? It doesn't work that way. Reconciliation, you can say sorry, but if there's not change in behavior, then what? And it's not just change in behavior, it's change in behavior over time. So I feel like I've forgiven. I can't control that person and how they navigate reconciliation. I can at least take my internal process of how I discern forgiveness and and say I've done that. I would say I've forgiven those seasons of hurt. Yep. Um, and and then I've chosen to move on. I think forgiveness is a tricky. It's a tricky thing, and we've talked about that last season. Forgiveness has come up in multiple stories, if not every story that we've had so far. And I would just say, there, yeah, there, to validate what you're saying, you can forgive someone for an incident, but when it happens over and over and over, and you're re- being re-traumatized every single time that that happens, 
sometimes forgiveness looks like I forgive you, but now I have a boundary and there's a line that you can't cross because you're no longer safe in that moment. Because I want to love you and because I want to be in relationship with you, I have to have a different boundary. Doesn't mean I don't forgive you, but it does mean that I, I have to have a boundary so that you can't continue to re-traumatize me over and over and over again. And that's really tricky, especially if it's with family. So yeah. That's, well, and I that's- think what I shared earlier, I think in a lot of like the general, you know, Christian world, it's usually the person that hurt is asking for, for, for the forgiveness. And there's pressure for that person to be forgiven. Yeah. Whereas the power is actually held in the person that's been hurt. In Christian culture, they remove that power for the person that was hurt. And so there's a demand, please forgive me. And it's right. like, hey, that person can choose when they want to forgive. There shouldn't be a pressure on when they want to forgive. That needs to be on their time. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So moving to... um some other life-changing moments that have happened in your life that have really shaped your faith. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, was that 2020, Jana, when Declan fell? It was 2020. Yeah. So in the midst of like a crazy already year where we're all locked inside with our little kids, I remember you were doing kindergarten for Declan online. I mean, it was like crazy. And the, the whole world's up in a, in a disarray and Declan crawls out of his window and ends up falling out of the third story of your house. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that he is okay today, that he is like living and he is thriving and seriously thank the Lord for that. But I want to talk about how that impacted your relationship with God in the midst of that happening and in the aftermath of that happening. Yeah. It's a day I think of often um, because of how traumatic it was. And I don't like thinking about it because it goes to the worst case scenarios, even though my kid is alive and breathing yep. and yep. has a lot of attitude now. <laughs> but it was a really painful part of our journey um, and also a miraculous. And this story is one that I'm like, I know there's a God because that God saved my kid. Yeah. Um, and God showed up in, in so many different people during that season. And I know that's not everybody's story, but that was my story uh, with my son. Um, so, yeah, my kid just turned five, literally the beginning of the month, turned five. And then um, we found him downstairs outside, which was really random in our backyard. And then it was like a click of, oh, my gosh, my kid fell out the window. Um, my husband took him to the hospital. Um, at that point, I just started calling people, uh, called family, and then called friends. Aaron was one of them. I remember feeling a lot of shame. How would I let my kid fall out the window? You hear the story all the time on the news. You don't think it's going to happen to you. Um, and I, you know, it was helpless, like a helpless feeling. Aaron and I both felt we were like texting each other. And um, I think in that moment of like, I don't know what else to do, but like people prayed. And so we had two roommates that were helping with my my youngest kid who was still in the room in a crib. I remember they were praying over me and then calling different people. Like I remember Aaron, you Aaron, told me um, and spoke over me of like, you're a good mom. This isn't your fault. Um, You you need to remember that you are a great mom. And I remember needing to hear that because I felt a lot of shame. How did I let this happen? and then I remember another friend called and, and shared. She was walking with her friend. And then her friend was like, I just saw God catch him. Because the crazy thing was my son didn't break any bones. and had no injuries to his brain, which is kind of shocking. Um, he had a lacerated kidney was his biggest injury and a lot of bruises. But he was coherent. He was on a lot of, a lot of medication, but <laughs> he was fine. And that was just shocking. There's just so many things that were shocking about that day. And I just remember that whole week, so many people showed up, had people bring me food. We had so many friends send Declan gifts in the mail, which was so sweet. It was my birthday that week. I was in the hospital on my birthday. I came home. There were gifts all over the entry of my home because people just brought gifts. We had food. That's how you make somebody feel seen. Yep. And, and not just for you, but like for your family. All these people showed up for my family. To me, that's a picture of what a community of God looks like. God gave me my son and kept my son on earth for us. Um, and that's like a testament to 
the goodness of God and the greatness of God. And um, so, yeah. Wow. That story, when I heard it the first time, I was like, wait, what? I didn't expect it to end that way. And to hear you experience a literal miracle and the words that your friends spoke, like, yes, it is so beautiful in that moment. This thing that you have experienced your whole life where you don't feel seen or you feel invisible, yeah. you feel so seen, so visible by the way your community showed up for you and your family. But girl, the way that God in that story, if you didn't know that he sees you and that you are yeah. visible to him and you matter to him, I yeah. mean, that is evidence right there that God Lo loves loves you girl and he sees you and not only do I believe that he caught your son but he caught you too and wiped away your tears in that moment and were, was just so present and knowing what you needed in that moment yeah. um wow like yeah literal, literal goosebumps literal goosebumps wow ah okay that is just crazy because in your story, we've heard about you really seeing yourself being seen by others and knowing you're seen by God. And as you've gone on this journey, and we mentioned this earlier about your purpose being born from even some of the painful parts of your story, you have gone on to be an absolute incredible advocate and ally for others. And yep. you talk about in the past couple of years, you started to attend a new church, one that is affirming and, oh, let me define what, when we say affirming means, but a, a church that's inclusive of the LBGTQIA um, community. And when you started to attend this church, it really shifted your perspective and your ability to see others. So can you talk to us a little bit about that faith shift and how attending this church has really changed you on your journey. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I attend a church called Cascade in Portland and, um, I grew up Baptist. So there's that. Um, and then I went to Christian college and then, um, yeah, I went to various churches around Portland, um, through my upbringing and adulthood. And so I landed here after being at a former church for a while and landed there because I knew the pastors from a prior job actually I had. And so we, as in my husband, I had um, kind of different values that we wanted to find in a new church. Um, so all to say, ended up at this church. So I've never been at a church where there's openly like queer people attending. Um, and so it took me for a second, like I knew about it. I just hadn't coexisted in the same church. And so I remember feeling like, oh, this is different. Um, why is this different? Like, what does feel different? And then going through the journey of like, going back to the why I thought that way. And then coming into the reality of like, this is cool that these people feel safe enough um, to be in a church space where they get to be involved in um i don't know it's kind of that the value of being seen that i want to instill in the people that i i interact with and i think that's really beautiful um and that we can coexist together i think it just it taught me a lot about who god is and that god is more than just these specific rules that we had and these different guidelines that i grew up believing god's bigger than that god loves people and i want to love people well. And I, and if I'm going to be the image of God to somebody, I hope that I'm displaying love. I know that sounds probably super generic, but, um, it shortly after that, I had a good friend, um, that I had spoken to in years and we reconnected and he shared that he's, he grew up super evangelical Christian parents were missionaries he came out to me and, and sh shared he's queer. And I was like, Thank you for sharing that. Like you are your full self. And I, I'm so happy that I get to see you at your full self. I don't think in my prior like years ago would be able to say, I'm so happy that you're you, you know? And so I was very grateful for even where I landed at my church to be like, okay, I had this faith shift 
And I can now fully love this person for who they are because they feel safe enough to share that with me. And they want to be seen by God in a way that they are seen by, like fully of who they are and loved by God for who they are because they were taught so much that you can't be that. And so for me, the church shifted a lot of my faith journey in the way I love people, specifically the queer community. And I want to teach my kids to love people well and be kind because I think that's what's modeled by the way we love God and how God loves us. Yeah. So it's so beautiful, Jana. You've used your your own story and the points of pain in your life to to advocate for others who have been cast out and in the moments in your life where you have felt unseen, that you felt cast out, not included, like you didn't have a place of belonging. Here's my sweet friend Jana that's creating those spaces of safety and belonging for those who have had the same experience. And I'm just, gosh, I'm so proud of you. And I, I'm just so honored to know you. You're just so incredible. Um, well, thank you for sharing your story with us today. We have some closing questions that we always ask our guests that we want to ask you too. And I'm really excited to hear your answers because you are so wise and so insightful in the, the things that you say. Um, so our first question is, if you had to give a definition of reconciliation, which you kind of already did earlier, but if you had to give a concise definition of what you think reconciliation is, what would that be? I would say reconciliation is the reconnection of a relationship that has growth in and change in behavior over the course of time um, in a positive way. And, and that reconciliation can cause two people to grow yep, um, for the better. And that could be together or apart. Like it could be the reconciliation of a relationship and then choose to not be in a relationship anymore, but they've reconciled that and then choose to live better as they move onward or they could be together. So, um, yeah. That's so, that's so, so good. So in your life, who, what, any circumstances, situations, people that you are struggling with when it comes to reconciliation? Um, family. <laughs> that's real. That's real. It's an ongoing process. Like you said, sometimes it doesn't happen overnight. And I think Aaron said, sometimes we're re-traumatized and we got to choose to yep. forgive and reconcile over and over and over again. Yep, absolutely. Jenna, what do you think that the Lord wants you to receive in your life right now? Um, I would say the Lord wants me to receive worthiness worthy of being who i am mm. it's good and what do you think the lord wants you to be reminded of right now um probably in the same realm like i'm valued i'm loved and valued yeah it's, it's funny because this is all the things that i like doing for other people <laughs> i'm like yeah. i need to remind of myself of this <laughs> Yep. Like you said earlier, and I think you hit the nail on the head, it's so much easier to do for others. And it's sometimes so hard to do that very same thing for our own selves. Yep. Yep. It's surreal to be on a podcast with two of my most incredible, thoughtful friends who give and give and give and give to other people. And yet when people try to give them something back... Yeah. They don't know how to handle it. So then they give them a gift <laughs> or a gift. We joke about that all the time. Jana gives you a gift for the gift that you gave her in teaching. God, well, we could do a whole other podcast talking about that. Jana, finally, what do you feel like the Lord is asking you to release right now? Shame. I feel a lot of shame. I think that I come from a culture of honor shame. So yeah. there's a lot of grinding in internally of like, I need to be outspoken, but I also need to be quiet. Yep. And so there's that rub that I continue to feel. So yep. I feel a lot of shame. Whew. Well, Jenna, thank you. I thank you. you. I am thankful that you accepted the invitation to be seen and heard on this podcast and for your story to be known because 
it's one that needs to be told. I know talking to you, I see myself in your story and have appreciated getting to know you and being able to know that I'm not the only um, one that sits in this intersection of not belonging anywhere and finding my place and claiming my identity for myself and learning your story and hearing your story and going on this journey with you as we prepare for this podcast has been absolutely amazing and so, so helpful. And I'm sure so many people that are listening to this will resonate with your story as well. And I know they'll want to hear more. So my question to you is where can people find you? How can they connect with you? I'm not super promoting myself in the way of socials and things, but I do have a, I mean, I have an Instagram. <laughs> um, it's J Kel, at J Kelsey, J K E L S A Y. Um, and then I start a business. So I do have a website um, that's yes. related to the work that I do, which is a virtual admin services. And that's at janakelsey.com. So mm-hmm. I love how well, I ask you where people connect with you and your immediate response is like, well, hold on, hold on. I don't actually like you know, promote myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a journey. It's a journey. <laughs> yep. It will be linked below. So there's no running from it now. But sister friend, <laughs> thank you so much again for coming on this episode. I love you, friend, so much. And forever gonna be grateful for your friendship. And I need to stop crying. So Titi, you should probably close us out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Thank you, Jana. I've also loved getting to know you and hearing your story. I'm so, so thankful for you. And I am excited for what the rest of your journey holds and um, the ways that you will just get to know yourself more and more and the ways that you will just get to see the way God knows you so intimately and formed you just as you are. So I cannot wait to see how the rest of this story maps out and unfolds. So with that, I will end by saying, let the reconciliation begin. Thanks so much for listening today. Want to stay up to date with our episode? Then subscribe to our podcast and newsletter on our website, come-union.com. Follow us on Instagram at come.union. Rather watch our podcast, then subscribe to our YouTube channel at come underscore union. We are so glad you're a part of this community.